Welcome to another Dragonland Saga review episode. It is Bakukul Deep Cult. This sounds so ridiculous. Bakukul. Uh, Deep Cult the 16th. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my review of Flint the King uh, by Mary Kirchhoff and Douglas Niles. Now, I would like to take a moment and thank the DL Saga members and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below. And of course, you can always pick up Dragonlance Gaming Materials using my affiliate links, and they are also in the description below. Now, this is just my perspective. Who cares? <laughs> but if your perspective differs, or if you agree with different points, or just want to share your thoughts, we got a live chat for that. That's right. So you can just dive into the uh, YouTube. I mean, don't actually do that. You'll hit your monitor. But type your thoughts in the YouTube chat. And as soon as I'm finished giving you my pre-written review... We sort of bounce back and forth with thoughts and have a little bit of fun on this Friday evening. I'm uh, <clears throat> struggling a bit today, but we're going to get through it. All right, how you doing, Chris? All right, so this, uh, the first third of this novel is pure Dragonlance gold. Flint is tired and weary of doing nothing in Solace now that his younger friends left on their quest a month ago. He's annoyed by the Seekers, which was hilarious, who have started infiltrating the town and even has a bit of a scuffle with a few of them. Then, as he's buying provisions, a dwarf named Hannock enters and strikes up a conversation, telling Flint about the Thiwar dwarves passing through Hillholm. Now, this strikes Flint as odd, as there is a generations-long, plural, long feud between the mountain and hill dwarves. And Hillholm is a hill dwarf community, Flint's home. This begins to gnaw at him, so he decides to leave Solace for Hillhome and discover the truth himself. On the road, he comes across a group of Darrow, or Thiwar, dwarves. One thing that I just want to sort of throw out here really quick. Um, there's a couple references to nicknames in this um, for men, like male dwarves, for female dwarves, and for the Thiwar dwarves. They call them the Darrow dwarves. I, and also with the um, Nidar, I'm sorry, not the Nidar, but the um, Gully Dwarves, the Agar Dwarves. And so there's nicknames for different dwarf types. Um, and I really like that. I, I like that they threw around a little bit of dwarven vernacular. You didn't need to add it, but it just added a little bit of dwarven cultural, I don't know, attention that, that I think is is desperately needed. You know, we seem to get a lot of that with elves generally, and it's nice to see the dwarves getting a little bit of love in that avenue. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, um, the Thiwar dwarves are leading a wagon, and they tell him to prove that he's not a spy or else they're going to kill him. And this ignites even more curiosity from Flint. He ends up beating them in a fight and they leave, but now there's this curious piece to the puzzle. They had to have come through Hillhome from Thorbarden, but all the gates to Thorbarden are destroyed or closed. So where did these Thiwar come from? And why would they care about a spy? Flint arrives home and doesn't recognize Hillholm at all. It's grown massively since he was there, and he doesn't recognize anyone either. He enters a familiar bar, and the human Muldoon still owns it. They strike up a conversation, and it turns out that the mayor of Hillholm has an arrangement with the Thiwar. They would pay to pass through the town and pay more than market share for services and supplies. The hill dwarves see it as a massive profitable opportunity, and everyone consented. Meanwhile, the advisor to Thane Realgar, the Thiwar clan in Thorbarden, named Pitrick, is visiting Sanction, delivering weapons to a high lord. The high lord demands double the supplies for double the money, and Pitrick is more than happy to comply. He is fueling the dragon army with dwarven weapons and getting rich from it. This gives their clan more power in Thorvarden. It wonderfully sets up the connection that we know they have before the war openly breaks out in Abanasinia, and the connective tissue is wonderful to see woven naturally into the story. So Pitrick returns to Thorbarden telling Realgar and demands a group of the Thane's personal guards to guard their secret entrance to Thorbarden, as a hill dwarf, Flint's brother Aelmar, had discovered the secret about the weapons and was killed for it. Back at Hillhome, Flint turns I'm sorry, Flint learns about Aelm I should probably just put on my glasses. Learns about Aelmar's death and has been blamed on a heart attack. We know that that is an issue with his family. 
The town idiot says that he witnessed it and the spell is cast that killed him. Um, I want to address this town idiot thing really quick. I don't know what's going on with me today. Um, I don't want to come off as being like overly sensitive about a stupid novel, especially a novel that was released decades ago. But it's a trope that regularly pops up in every medium, right? Whether it's a TV show, a film, or whatever, other novels. This idea of that, like, it's, it's either going to be like the town drunk, the town idiot, the town near do well, and everyone just sort of like, you know, scoffs at this individual, whomever they may be. And it's always just that someone who is deficient in some way, they either have a chemical imbalance or, uh, you know, possibly a mental uh, disorder. And people are always shitting on him, like, constantly. Can we get past this trope already? Like, and I'm not saying it because, like, culturally, we're in a time when we shouldn't. No, and I, I don't, that doesn't equate anything to me. It's just this idea that simply because someone is different, they're a fucking idiot? I, don't, I just don't like it. I don't like how they're just, like, casting this dispersion on this person who clearly is intelligent enough to recognize what actually happened when no one else did and the truth and reality of what's going on when no one else does. Can we just move past this, this shitty trope? It drives me crazy. Anyway, I can't really blame them because this was, you know, again, decades ago and it wasn't overused then. Arguably it was, but still. Nowadays, we should be way past this. And yet I still see it creeping up from time to time in different medium. All right. So... This town idiot believes that Flint is the ghost of Aylmar who came back to torment him. Flint meets the family and feels little connection to them. They are all celebrating the new town wealth, ignoring the generational feud with the mountain dwarves. Flint's nephew, Aylmar's son, Basalt, is drinking a ton to hide his feelings about his father's death. Wow, I don't know what's going on with me today. Uh, And his guilt as they fought the day that it happened. Flint ends up investigating the wagons and kills a Thiwar, but left his boots behind. His y- Oh, man, I totally... I feel like I'm jumping through this here. Um, his younger brother, Tybalt, is a constable and threatens to reveal Flint as the killer, but Flint leaves to look for the secret entrance to Thorbarden to prove that the Thiwar are being deceitful to everyone, Mountain and Hill Dwarf. Basalt follows him to apologize for his behavior, and they fight a troll together. Then Flint sneaks into Thorbarden behind a Thewar wagon and is trapped. Flint is taken to Pitrick, who asks for the Gully Dwarf to be rounded up and for them to meet at the monster pit. The Gully Dwarf is thrown in as a show of force to Flint, and they ask what he is doing there. Flint tells them that he knows what they are trading and that all Hillhome knows about it as well, which is a lie. Patrick is furious. I'm sorry. It says Patrick. I think it's Pitrick. Pitrick is furious that Flint attacks him. Oh, man. I'm I'm sorry, guys. I got to put on my glasses. I am butchering this thing. Pitrick is furious. Then Flint attacks him, but is pulled away by the guards. Patrick... Uh, I thought I double-checked all this. Pitrick tells the guards to throw him into the pit, and Parian intervenes. She is then also thrown into the pit when the two try to evade a carrion crawler. As they run down the tunnel, they're saved by gully dwarves who tell them that they are now in Mudhole. Mudhole is the agar village in Thorbarden. Now saved from the beast pit, they're offered food and do their best to communicate that they want to leave, but the gully dwarves believe that they have fulfilled a prophecy and want them as their king and queen. They tie up Flint, who will not stop trying to leave, and Perrin just stands watching with a slight smile on her face. Flint eventually resigned to his fate and accepts the role of king, giving his word not to try to flee. Perrin is made queen, and they send the gully dwarves out to gather supplies in new areas Perrin designated. Obsessed with having Perrin as a servant, Pitrick used a wish to resurrect her from what he believed was her death from the carrion crawler and to be placed as his servant. The wish spell went off and he grew older. A little bit of advanced Dungeons and Dragons game mechanics here. But she didn't appear. He was confused, then began to think that perhaps she wasn't dead when a guard brought a gully dwarf looking for some smoke weed from his personal personal staff. 
Pitrick knew Perrion had the same addiction to the weed, so he levitated down the beast pit and saw the gully dwarf hole. The carrion crawler ended up attacking him, and he flew up, but he sent magic missiles into the wall and the carrion crawler into mud hole. As the agar and their king and queen were setting up for a feast, the agar began a sport called Agarpold. <laughs> where they launched themselves at walls and streams. This gave Flint an idea. He'd already sent Gully Dwarves to deliver a message to his nephew that he hopes returned to Hillhome after waiting for him outside of Thorbarden, but if they need to fight, perhaps these Agar could help. Then the carrion crawler entered the room. Chaos ensues as the Agar attacked it, and then Pitrick flew in and tried to abduct Parian. Flint cut off two of his fingers, including a magic ring, and Pitrick fled for his life as the Agar defeated the beast. Basalt left the entrance Flint disappeared into when the Thewar came out of it in mass. He ran away, running into another Thewar group who beat him and then let him go, thinking he would be hunted by them. When he arrives back in Hillhome, he got into an argument with a Thewar who attacked him. The barkeep got in the way and was killed. Then Basalt was abducted by the gully dwarves that Flint sent and brought to Mudhole. Flint was stunned and annoyed until he was told that the ring he removed from Pitrick's finger was a teleportation ring. So he told Basalt to go back home, tell everyone the truth about Pitrick and the weapon smuggling, and get ready for a coming war from the Thewar because of his big mouth. Now, Pitrick is gathering the troops, readying to march to Hillholm and destroy it, and Flint is reading the agar, I'm sorry, readying the agar for battle training and searching for weapons. Perrion gives Flint an axe, which turns out to be the axe that he lost years before. It was originally a gift from his now-dead brother, and the Tharkin axe somehow found its way back into his hands. He was speechless, and gave Perrion a leaf necklace that he carved, and then they made love. It was a great moment for Flint, and Flint has been refusing to acknowledge his feelings for Perrion because she's a mountain dwarf and he's a hill dwarf. The animosity runs deep between these two sub-races, but he finally lets his guard down and got some. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> they marched off toward Hillhome as Basalt is convincing the town of the deceit. They all prepare defenses as Basalt and a group travel after the last shipment to steal their weapons. They assault them, get the weapons as the Thewar march toward Hillhome. A massive early winter blizzard hits as they're traveling. Some of the gully dwarves go missing, and Flint and Parian realize that they'll never catch the Thewar. That is, until the missing Agar attack them, then flee to a lake. The other Agar, led by Flint, give the two-mile chase down the mountain and eventually catch up to them, with the lake bank breaking and everyone being dumped in. The Agar doggy paddled ashore, and the armed Thewar sink like rocks. Evidently, they're not witches. <laughs> Everyone knows witches float like rocks in churches, uh, dropping the Thewar force by a third. Now, I am really enjoying the cultural explanation of the Agar dwarves and really want to run a one-off adventure with them as the player characters. But that's an aside there. So the rest of the Thewar army proceed to Hillhome, stopping in the dark to search for their now-missing regiment. Flint and his Agar army slipped past them and enter Hillhome. They helped fortify and build up defenses, planning the defense of the army, which is imminent. This is a great way to end the novel, by the way, with a truly epic battle that is pitched from one side to the other. Pitrick was fervent about killing everyone, even though the military commanders were wary to continue assaulting them as the agarpults, sludge bombers, and creeping wedgies were more effective against them than anticipated. The magic used by the Thewar allowed entry into Hillhome as the Nidar retreated to the brewery. Pitrick, I keep saying, I hate autocorrect. It is the worst invention ever created. I know people are like, oh, but I don't know how to spell. Learn how to spell! It's that simple. And me, being a lazy scumbag who never turns it off of Google Documents, now has Patrick, and every time I write Caraman, it comes out as cardamom. <laughs> the spice. Ah, autocorrect is the bane of our human existence. All right, so Pitrick enters with his soldiers and saw Perrion collecting dwarves for the brewery and used magic to control her. The magic waned and she attacked him with a knife, then tried to flee. Pitrick then hit her with a lightning bolt. Now look, I just want to jump in here really quick. If you have been waiting, just sitting on a lightning bolt spell... 
Don't waste it on one person. That thing will go in a straight line hitting everything in its range, in its width range. And it'll just continue to go. Like, store that shit up, Pitrick. What's your problem, man? I just don't get it. Anyway, so he shoots her with a freaking lightning bolt. And then she staggers over to Flint in the brewery and dies in his arms. Talk about a beautiful and emotional scene. Flint finally realized that there was someone that he could love in life, despite his racial hatred. And now she died. I really appreciated the shock that the writers allowed Flint to have in that moment. The Thiwar now bombard the brewery and ultimately Flint, enraged, opens the door and attacks them with the Tharkin axe. It absorbs a spell that Petrick casts at him and they go toes. Petrick is incredibly skilled at fighting, which shocked me, and the battle goes back and forth until finally Flint buries the Tharkin axe in Petrick's chest, breaking his amulet of Tachesis shadowy forms of Reorks and Tekisis battle above Hillhome as an earthquake ravages the town. Many are killed in the earthquake and the few are flee back to Thorbarden. When it's over, the ghostly forms vanish and many Nidar leave the Hillhome, uh, well, leave Hillhome after graves have been dug and filled. Everyone felt loss from this battle, but the Fireforges stayed. It ends with a nice epilogue where the Dragon High Lord and Sanction is disappointed about the missing Thewar weapons shipment, but his armor is ready and he's anxious to use them. This was a great Dragonlance novel filled with action and adventure, love and sorrow, all with a hefty side of humor. It felt like it really had stakes and treated the characters with respect, even the Agar. In the end, Flint was usurped as king by another Agar, but he didn't mind, of course. I do wish we would have seen Flint's perspective change in the other novels, as he clearly grew affection for these Agar dwarves, and it would be nice to see a lasting impact from his experiences. I would highly recommend this Dragonlance novel to... I'm sorry. I would highly recommend this novel to Dragonlance fans, dwarf fans, and anyone who loves good fantasy novels out there. All right, so what do you guys have to say? Uh, you never gave much thought to Flint's immediate family reading the Chronicles. You love his family, particularly his sister. Yeah, he has a great family. Well, here's the deal. Everyone has a wild and crazy family. Sometimes it's horrible and abusive and you know, it goes off the rails. But most people just have really strange, you know, people in their families. It's a very colorful, real-life expression that I found in Flint's family that echoed throughout not just my own, but my friends that I know. And I, I like that about life. You know, we always reference whether something is normal or not, or abnormal. But there's no such thing. Those are manufactured ideas that we created. They don't actually exist in nature. Normal is just what we're accustomed to. Abnormal is what we're not accustomed to. So this idea of a normal family is complete and utter BS. Everyone has problems in their families. Every family is a uh, this incredibly difficult stew, of, you know, made up of a myriad of different factors. Blood has little to nothing to do with family, and you can go back in all of human history to explore that idea. I think Flint's family was a hundred percent wonderful, and I love the complexity that was all buried and wrapped up all within it. Money played a huge role, which I loved. Um, just emotional connections to each other or the loss or the absence of each other played huge roles. I mean, it felt real. It felt lived in. It felt authentic. I loved it, too. I thought it was great. Your biggest complaint is that Flint never mentions entering Thorbard, nor the fact that he's aware of mass weapons being shipped north. Yeah, the fact that he knows an entrance into Thorbarden while they are actively seeking an entrance to Thorbarden at the end of the novel Dragon's Bottom Twilight. Huh, that's kind of odd. But yeah, there, there's tons of stuff like that with every Dragonlance novel. So you kind of got to pick your battles when it comes to criticizing. This had a lot of issues, like his feeling about the Gully Dwarves and being made their king. In the novel, he really respects them, and he actually grows to appreciate and stands up for them against other hill dwarves. Like, that's growth. That's beautiful. You realize your biases, your life experiences change your perspectives, and you move forward with a new perspective. That's how life happens. You don't just hold on to the animosity that you are taught. 
That's racism that goes away with education. So that's the ignorant starting point. Flint grows in this novel. And then we go and reread Chronicles and he goes right back to step one. It's so frustrating for me, especially when it comes to like racism and bigotry. There's just no reason for it. It doesn't affect your life, what other people do or think or believe. So who cares what they are? Who cares how they think? Who cares how they fucking feel? Just live your life. You know, if it doesn't affect you directly in like a tangible way, move along. I just, I've never understood it. Uh, let's see. Hodor from the Game of Thrones was the exception, I think, that proves the rule. I think he's an exception because he ties in later on as to why he is the way he is. Yes, he was treated poorly, but I really loved the reason later on. And for those of you who don't know that, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's beautiful. And it has real weight to the Game of Thrones novels and... Um, Actually, I'm not 100% sure that part was actually in the novels yet. But anyway, it was great in the series. Let's see. Uh, you thought the fun story beat could have been Petrick's wish spell didn't have about expiration on it, so Perrion could have been resurrected at the end. Oh, that would have been terrible. <laughs> that would have been horrible. Uh, you love this book. The three units he forms, the gully doors is so funny. Yeah, yeah, Michael. Thanks for tuning in live. I, I love gully doors. I don't know why people hate... I, Okay, I think the reason why people hate Gully Dwarves is because they, the same rant that I had about the Village Idiot. They think it's this casting dispersion of this entire race as a bunch of idiots. The difference between the two is that they are an entity, a whole of, in, into themselves. This isn't a Gully Dwarf who is treated badly. This is the species. It was started that way. It ended that way. But they're not defined wholly because of their ignorance or their dopiness. They're actually, like, they grow. They, they're allowed to form up units and fight and win battles. Like, it's fun to cast dispersions on a group that is fictional and manufactured to be a certain way. And then you're proven through the actual game itself that they're not just that. That they are actually insightful and caring and loving and effective. That's the strength of the gully dwarves. That's why I love agar dwarves. Um, that they're not just one note wonders that people claim that they are. There's so much more depth to them. It's, it's as if a culture was isolated, a human culture was isolated on an island. And, and we do have that in our country, or I'm sorry, in our, uh, um, on our planet right now. We have varying degrees of technology, right? So there are still cultures that have minimal to no contact, like active contact with civilized humans. They're living in very primitive ways. These are very ignorant to modern sensibilities, modern knowledge, but they are wildly intelligent about their own lives. Like we, civilized humans, could never go live on the land like they do. Even though we see them as primitive, they're more advanced in different ways. That's the same thing with the Agar as I perceive them in Dragonlance. And that's why I like them. You have different civilization levels of the same species because that's how life exists. We, we are separated by cultures. We're separated by manufactured borders that we've created. Go up to Canada, go down to Mexico, stay here in the U.S. of A. The cultures are wildly different in very different ways. Just in my state, you go where I live right now, you go one street over and it's a wild cultural shift than it is where I am on my street. That's the strength of the human experience about what it means to live. You get to experience other people's perspectives and that educates you and informs you. That's good. That's not a bad thing. All right, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. All right. Hey, Malcolm. Thanks for doing live. How you doing? So uh, the book makes you wish that they had added a story somewhere in the saga where Flint's body was returned to his family as a hero of Lance. Ooh, that would have been good. Oh, man. But that, that moment when... Uh, this is a spoiler for anyone who hasn't read a 40-year-old book. Um, that moment when Fizban takes him to reorks, it gets me. It's beautiful. It would have been beautiful and stuff if it was like he, you know, Fizban appeared with Flint at his home and stuff. But at that point, 
this story wasn't created. So there was, there was no knowledge about this aspect of it. You know, it was just isolated within the Heroes of the Lance and that War of the Lance story. So I'm glad that it went the way it did. I mean, Tannis's reflection and attacking of Everman, um, the whole companions just being filled with sorrow, looking at God's home, seeing the constellations. And when, uh, it's getting me right now, when Fizban takes up his body, and then you see this, the, the constellation appear in God's home's mirrored floor reflection of the sky. It was beautiful. And it was a wonderful way to give a, a, a heartfelt and powerful send-off to a character that has been used as almost a comedic foil for most of the novel. And now we could actually see a, like a, a heart and soul to him. So I didn't mind it so much anyway. Um, what else here? Uh, one of the funniest moments of any Dragonlance book ever was when the Gully Dwarves released Flint from his oath by telling him it's just not working out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the Gully Dwarves, man. I can't help it. They're hilarious. When they did their version of the Dwarven marching song, it was amazing. I was laughing my ass off. I loved it. That was so good. Uh, Cardamon Majorum, yeah. Autocorrect. That's how it goes. This book makes you like Flint less in this aspect. He's still prejudiced against Mountain Dwarves in the Chronicles and Lost Chronicles. His love of Parian should have changed that. Yeah. Um, this, again, speaks to Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman ignoring everything that they have not personally written in Dragonlance, which drives me insane. It drives me nuts. I can't handle it. I, I just don't understand. It doesn't take any effort to show the respect of the other authors who played in the playground that you created. It doesn't show, it doesn't take any effort. It's inclusive. That seems to be a good thing for most people. Ugh. Um, Sean, thanks for tuning in live. Good to see you, man. What else? The final battle was epic. You love them falling back in the tavern for one last stand. Well, it was the, it was the brewery that they fell back into, which is a little bit different, but it is different. And I love that too. I thought it was great. Breweries are typically like, if you've ever seen um, like uh, the Isles of Scotland and they have just breweries or distilleries all over, they're always like these big, massive brick buildings. That would definitely be a great fallback place. <laughs> like oh, if we go to the tavern, we're going to be burned to the ground by the wooden structure. You go to the distillery or the brewery, it's stone. We're probably going to be okay. Um, wh what's up? Uh, things never change when it comes to Flint. Something or someone, Kender always gets on his nerves. Yeah, Flint, Flint and Tazlov's back and forth is beautiful. He actually got emotional when Flint's nephew had to convince his family to believe him about the Thuar. It was written believably and beautifully. We all need family or friends like that. Yeah, I mean that's just um, the character of Basalt was amazing. Um, we are introduced to him in a place of just pain and self-destruction and he has to fight through that and he has to learn to swallow his pride and he has to learn to apologize and accept his feelings and admit them to people that he doesn't want to and then he's just completely depressed and just 100% down on himself and it takes his uncle to bring him out of that funk I mean if we could all have a family member as supportive as Flint is, we would be the luckiest people in the world, you know? And it doesn't take any effort for you to be that for your family. Just share your feelings with them every once in a while. Tell them that you appreciate what they're doing, who they are. You may not agree with people's opinions or behaviors, but you can still respect them and tell them that you love them despite them. And there's nothing wrong with that. It gives them support. It gives them a little bit of... Uh, uh, something to fall back on when they feel really down, which is probably what's feeding the behavior that you're not enjoying in the first place. Give them the support they need. All right. Um, standard Dragonlance author to author continuity. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, Buffy was great, Malcolm. I agree. <laughs> Explain their different settings. Uh, people overlook the fact that Gully Doors are survivors. They're great cooks. They're great cooks. They're cooks. Um, they're caring and they're a happy species. Yeah. 
they're wildly happy. I love that about them. I'm not like that. So it's totally outside of my wheelhouse, but I really enjoy it. Uh, Chris, Adam, and I think Flint and Gimli would get along great. Well, they totally wouldn't. They're, pre- they're pretty much the same character. <laughs> I mean, really. And probably intentionally the same character. Uh, books should definitely be read in order by first published date. Yeah, I think so too, Malcolm. It makes logical sense that way when you run into these continuity errors. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, I get it. But I'm still going to appreciate X or Y because of it. You know what I mean? Or in spite of it. Um, let's see. You've asked me before about different authors going in different directions, but the same character story like dragons. Yeah. All right. So that is it. I, I really did have a good time with this novel. Um, it actually was different than I remember it being. Not dramatically, but just, I, I don't know if it was just life experience or things that I've gone through in life or whatever, but it resonated more with me, especially the relationship between Basalt and Flint. Uh, I thought that was beautiful. And um, Perry and, and Flint's relationship was genuinely touching. And I wish Perrion was around longer because I love her as a character and I would love novels about her. I think she is a wonderful character who has a convoluted and complex history of her own that they only alluded to. I would love to know more about. And you don't always have to kill people off to have dramatic conclusions to stories. I understand that like we never saw Perry and Flint's life later on. And so you got to get rid of her or something, but there's other ways of doing it. Like you, you crafted such a beautiful character in Perry that like keep her around. I, I want more of her. I think she's, she's smart. She's witty. She's genuinely caring. Like she's a great dwarven woman. Like I want to hang out with her. You know, I'd love to share an ale with her or whatever a dwarven spirit with her. She's awesome. But fan fiction, that's what we got. That's what we can do, people. All right, that's it. Thank you for (laughs) listening to my rants and my review of Flint the King by Paul B. Thompson and Tanya R. Card. That's wrong. I did not update that. (laughs) As I'm reading, I'm like, huh, wait a second. No, it was actually uh, Mary Kirchhoff and Douglas Niles. Douglas Niles is as Dragonlance as it can get. First of all, he wrote a lot of the modules that uh, the DL1 through, I don't know what it was, like 16 or something when they were finally finished with all of it. But he wrote a lot of them. So it, like he is as integral to Dragonlance as anyone else, and more so than some. So whenever you see his name come up, you stop and pay attention because it's going to be good, and it's going to be steeped in real Dragonlance. And that's what this novel was. I loved it. All right. Um, what did you think of the Battle of Hillhome? Did you enjoy the Agar Dwarves portrayed herein? And finally, what did you think of the connection to the Dragon Armies? Feel free to email me at info at dlsaga.com or leave a comment below. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell to get notified about upcoming videos, and click the stupid like button. All that goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. And this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the... <sighs> failing continuity of the Dragonlance Saga. Thank you so much for joining in that celebration. So for Dragonlance Saga, my name is Adam. Until next time, Slanjavar.